Welcome to this lesson on the Airbus briefings. This lesson is fundamental to your training. It is an important lesson because Airbus has recently redesigned the briefing techniques and the elements for standardized briefings. And this is to ensure standardization across the Airbus flying network. Now, what's specifically important in the new briefing techniques here, as we're going to be discussing, is how they focus on identifying and mitigating threats and errors. Long briefings with a lot of elements is not ideal, nor is it acceptable to do briefings where we simply state briefing is standard. Briefings are there for a purpose. We will start with a few notes on how the briefing is done and what the purpose of the briefings are. When Airbus redesigned the briefing techniques a couple of years ago, they put a lot of emphasis now on three topics of the briefing itself. First and foremost, the briefing purpose is to manage risk. This is done through threat and error management. The second element is to identify any deviations from SOPs. If you have been familiar with the briefings from Airbus from previous layouts, you will now learn and understand how a lot of the items that we otherwise brief has been moved to SOPs and are no longer part of the briefings. The idea behind the new briefing techniques is to create a shared mental model between the pilot flying and the pilot monitoring, which then will lead to increased situation awareness and overall increase in safety. The first element here, manage risk, is how we identify and mitigate threats and errors. We simply look for any potential threat and errors that might affect our daily routine and we brief them as a crew. We only brief those items, which means briefings will be different from flight to flight. In the second element here, identify deviations from SOP. We talk about anything that is not daily routine. We do not, as we have previously, go through the FMTS setup, the chart layout, etc. We talk here only about deviations from daily routine and we will list them out, PM will go first, and then the pilot fly. This will generate a shared mental model between PM and PF, that after the briefing, both crew members are totally in the know of what the intentions are. We use this same layout for both the departure briefing and for the arrival briefing. Remember, Briefings should complement the SOPs. They should not repeat them. Previous briefing techniques, if you have been familiar with these, list items that have to do with FMGS check, fuel check, etc. However, to shorten the briefings and to make only relevant parts of the briefing, part of the briefing technique, a lot of these items have now been moved to the SOPs. You'll find this during the lesson on SOP. Briefings should never be routine. They are meant to break the routine. So, if you're in the habit, as many crews are, to simply state briefing is routine or takeoff standard, that is not a proper briefing and should be avoided at all times. A really good briefing requires out-of-the-box thinking. We are to list and discuss things that are not routine, so you have to think about what threats and errors can impact my flight today. We follow the same layout for both the departure and the arrival briefings. We start always with the plan. PM will start by talking about what is the planned intentions. Then the pilot flying will complement the plan from the pilot monitoring, talking about his or her plan to execute the intentions. Then the pilot monitoring will start with the threats. What does he or she see as the potential threats for this particular flight? 
And finally, the pilot flying will jump on to talk about the threats in his or her opinion. This is then done through identifying the threats and mitigating the threats and the errors. Now let's jump into the cockpit to see how a professional crew will do the briefing and then we will take apart the elements and discuss them. Here is the party briefing example number one. Okay, I think we're ready. Your pilot monitoring, so yep. go ahead with the brief. Okay, so we are planning uh, runway 04 right for departure with the Kennedy 5 uh, SID. Initially, Climb to 5,000 feet with an MSC uh, in our departure segment of 2,000 feet. And in terms of uh, fuel, uh, we have no extra. Okay, that's great. As we taxi out, we need to think about the hotspot at Juliet, even though four left is closed by no time. For four right, we talked about it in the um, briefing room. We've only got 19 meters of stop margin on the wet runway there. There's no engine out, Sid. So as you get airborne, it's going to be SOPs. Mm -hmm. So what do you see as the, uh, the threats? I feel a little bit uh, tired from the previous uh, long flight. And uh, that's it. Yeah, I'm the same. I see threats the same. We're both a bit tired. It's the end of a long day. Uh, it's going to be even more uh, stressing with the high amount of uh, radio uh, transmissions around New York. So for the mitigations of that, we need to be really vigilant mm -hmm. with the radio calls. We need to listen out for our call sign, listen out for our clearances. Of course, in the event of uh, failure, when I take the uh, radios, that we need to remember to prioritize to fly, navigate, and communicate uh, after that. Yeah, absolutely agree. Questions? No, thank you. Let's go. We saw here in the example that it was the pilot monitoring who initiated the briefing, and this is standard now. The pilot monitoring started the briefing by talking about the planned intentions, here listing the takeoff runway, the cleared altitude, the minimum safe altitude, and extra fuel and time. The pilot flying then complemented this by talking about his intentions for the planned departure. He listed the hotspots, which are particular to the taxi route and takeoff runway, the stop margin available in case of a rejected takeoff, the engine out SID procedure if applicable, then the return or diversion procedure that might be applicable in case of an emergency right after takeoff, and any non-routine operation, again, that are applicable. This lists the planned intentions from the crew, and both pilots are now on the same page. The second element of the briefing will be the threat and error management. Here again, it's the pilot monitoring initiating the threats part of the briefing, talking about the threats that he or she sees as potential to this particular flight. We will in the upcoming slide talk about the potentials that can be discussed here, but remember, it's out of the box thinking, anything that is not part of SOPs. After the PM stating the threats, the pilot flying will then state his or her input to the threats and together they will talk about the threat mitigation. The final part of the briefing is any miscellaneous items that might be particularly important to this particular departure and this is always the layer to follow. Remember, PM initiates the briefing and pilot flying complements, both for the plan part, for the threat part, and for the mitigation. The elements that are given up here as part of the plan part are the fixed items that should be briefed, and you will see that these items will change every time, so no two briefings should be alike. Let's jump back in the cockpit and look at another crew performing the departure briefing using the layout we just saw right here. This is departure briefing example number two. Are you ready for the uh, departure briefing? Yes, I'm ready. So I checked the box. The plan is to mm -hmm. depart via uh, runway 18. Yes. The departure route Aniki 9 Lima. Mm -hmm. First cleared altitude 4,000 feet, mm -hmm. where we have an MSA during departure of 3,300 feet. Okay. 
and uh, we have for uh, extra fuel for 10 minutes. Okay, good. Yeah, that matches my plan as well. Uh, to complement this, uh, this plan, um, I expect to be pushed back facing, facing west, and then we continue on taxiway in November to mm -hmm. the runway 18. Mm -hmm. um, for the uh, rejected takeoff, we don't have much stop margin, only around right. 200 meters, so that's mm -hmm. not much. Um, for the uh, engine out SID, uh, it's, it differs from the normal SID, so in this case we'll climb straight ahead to 2,000 feet, and when we reach 2,000 feet we'll make a left turn to view our uh, Fox Fox mic. And as the MSA is below 4,000 feet, slightly below 4,000 feet, I would recommend to uh, climb to 4,000 feet in this case. Yeah, fine. And to, uh, for the return case, um, we are above max landing weight, mm -hmm. uh, but we have already done a calculation to come back, so uh, this is an option to, to, to land on runway 25 again. Yeah. Do you see any threats uh, for our uh, departure? Yeah, I realized we have uh, pretty much tailwind for takeoff, close to the limit. Yeah, uh, true. So yes. according to our calculations now, nine knots, so we have yeah. to consider the wind during the takeoff, I think. Yes. And also we know that we have just one reverser operative. Exactly. Um, how d did we mitigate that? That's right. We calculated already in our uh, performance calculation, one reverser knob. Yes. So this is true. done. Okay. And we have to keep this in mind if we have to do another calculation for a diversion. Yeah, good uh, point. Landing performance. Yeah, good point. Okay. In case of rejected takeoff or landing mm -hmm. uh, later, um, I will use both reverses. All right. Do you see any other threats? No, not at the moment. That's okay. it, I think. Me neither. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you. As we saw here, there is no mentioning of abnormal emergency procedures. The review of abnormal emergency procedures should not be standard for departure briefing. They should be part of the crew's preparation for a flight, not the briefings. Length of briefings should always vary. They can be short, they can be long, but should never as a standard be either short or long. Remember, a long briefing is not necessarily a good briefing. And under no circumstances is it allowed or acceptable to simply say briefing standard. Elements to consider as part of the threats and miscellaneous part could be the level of fatigue felt by the crew, crew members who have limited experience in the cockpit or are unfamiliar with the airport for which they are departing from, Weather operations such as hot or cold weather operation that might require special attention to anti-icing procedures, etc. Or flying and departing in high mountainous terrain. These are not all of the elements that can be included but should be given consideration when giving your briefing. Let's jump into the arrival briefing and look at how it follows the same layout and the same element, more or less. The arrival briefing given by the crew when all has been set up for the arrival and the approach, again, is designed to minimize the time spent on the briefing. Therefore, all checks have already been done by the two crew members. The idea here is to limit the head down time as part of the briefing. We follow the same layout as we did before with the planned intentions first, then the threats and the mitigation as part of the arrival and approach. Let's jump back in the cockpit and look at the professional crew performing their arrival briefing. This is the arrival briefing example number one. So we are shortly before top of descent. Yeah. You've checked everything. Are you ready for Yes, briefing? I did. I'm ready. So the plan is, as I perceive it, that we're, we're flying now in Mount Safsa, that we expect the Safsa uh, arrival. Mm -hmm. The uh, minimum off-route altitude right now is 7,000 feet, uh, and the MSA is 3,000 feet. Mm -hmm. We're doing an ILS approach, runway 27. Right. The minimum descent altitude is 540 feet. 
and the missed approach procedure is uh, we fly straight ahead 2,500 feet and then make a right turn direct uh, seven miles uh, from the ILS DME mm -hmm. and we'll maintain 2,500 feet during the approach, during the missed approach. Mm -hmm. uh, we do not have any additional fuel for time being. That's okay. my, my, yeah. uh, my plan so Fine. far. Fine, that's what I've set up and I will fly the ILS uh, Amway 2.7. Um, fully managed, okay, and with configuration full mm -hmm. depending. Uh, we know now we have wet runway, yeah, and uh, like bumpy crosswind conditions. Yeah, do you see any further threats? Yeah, like I mentioned, uh, I see one threat that we have uh, no additional fuel, and the weather is yeah. close to the minimum. Yeah. So, in case we don't see the runway at the minimum, uh, we should. Um, we should take the decision to uh, to fly straight to the um, to the alternate aerodrome. To the alternate, yeah, fine. Because we don't have much mm -hmm. time to to circle around and yeah. then make a choice. Yeah, that's true. So if weather is an issue at the minima, we then we uh, divert to the alternate. Yeah. Okay. I see. And the second one would be I'm quite unfamiliar with the aerodrome. I've never been there. Yeah. So. Um, okay. No I see. Experience. Yeah, I flew there several times, so we maybe we have to be aware of the offset of the localizer. It's about two degrees offset to the okay. runway, and we have to align to the uh, runway center line, short on final. Yeah. And uh, the runway then will have a slight downhill slope. Okay. So I will try to make a firm landing, okay. no long yeah. flare. Okay. And as I mentioned, full reverse, all standard. Okay. That's all the threats that I can foresee. All right, okay, thank you. Thank you. Just as it was with the departure briefing, it is the pilot monitoring who initiates the arrival briefing. The pilot monitoring will start by talking about the planned intentions. He or she will, as the gentleman did in the example here, start with the arrival procedure itself. If you've been cleared for a particular star, any constraints, and radar vectors, etc. He will also state the moral and or MSA, the approach which has been programmed and are intended with the landing runway, the minimum descent altitude or decision height as set into the system, the missed approach procedure, and any extra time and fuel available. The planned intentions will then be complemented by the pilot flying, stating the approach to be flown, the level of automation, managed, selected, raw data, the configuration for the landing, as well as the conditions of the runway, dry, wet, and any crosswind that might be particular to the landing. This summarizes the plan intentions from the crew and again are not standard. They will then, by the PM initiating the second part of the briefing, talk about the threats for the intended arrival and approach and potentially go around procedure and the pilot flying will complement. This is done through threats identifying and then threat mitigation. Any miscellaneous parts will be covered at the end, but should, just like the departure briefing, not include standard operating, normal, everyday routine items. This is the layout, identical to the layout we saw in the departure briefing, but with the elements right here, particular to the arrival briefing. Let's jump back in the cockpit and look at the professional crew performing their second arrival briefing. Okay, I think we're all set up in the FMS. We both looked at it. So mm -hmm. why don't you start the uh, briefing? Yeah, okay, I looked at it. So we are currently clear direct class and the plan is to fly an ILS approach runway 14, which is set up in the box. Uh, the minima is 1602, which is 200 feet above uh, aerodrome elevation. And uh, the missed approach I checked in the box also. We can uh, follow the NAV. Uh, it's straight ahead 5.1 miles, then we turn left, heading north, climbing 4,000 feet, and then we can continue with the box. And uh, I realized that we have no extra fuel. 
Okay. Okay. So what I'm planning on doing is flying uh, standard ILS, uh, fully managed, uh, with flat full. Okay. Okay. Once uh, on the runway, I use minimum reverse for uh, the airport, keep the noise down. We've only got 445 meters of uh, stop margin. Mm -hmm. So that's something we need to think about. The BTV will be set up for uh, Hotel 2. That's the second of the high speeds right. uh, towards the bottom end. And we'll, we'll come off that. And there is a hot spot before we cross the runway, before we go to our next when we take the parking. Yeah. Right. Uh, I've got nothing uh, non-standard for the arrival in there. Uh, let's talk about threats now. What do you see? You know, we have the weather close to the minima, close to the 200 feet, the ceiling. And uh, also we have slight tailwind. Yeah, so for me, that's a threat that I see right now. Yeah. And pretty short margin. So if we have a long float, so you have to, uh, you have to be careful with a long floating landing. Or otherwise, we can use the reverse. We plan now to, to uh, use either reverse now. If you need more reverse, then we can open the reverse yeah. during the landing okay. road. Yeah, we, it's, a, it's a place where there's a lot of high ground. Uh, we briefed the MSAs. Uh, within, there was a note within 17 miles, it's 5,900 feet. Yeah. So that's a threat as well. So the mitigations then, uh, we'll plan on doing a completely normal landing, but as you say, if we do float, uh, we either uh, use full reverse or we do a go around. Uh, the weather's not so great. The mitigations is to fly completely standard using the automatics and our uh, SOPs. Exactly. Yeah. Um, anything else we can do to mitigate the threats? No, I think that that covers it. Yeah, I think good, so too. Good observance of uh, normal procedures. Okay. Okay. Yeah, questions? fine. No questions so far. For arrival briefings, there are elements that should be considered by the crew. Again, such as fatigue, crew members with limited experience flying into unfamiliar airports, high mountainous terrain, and the status of the aircraft as listed on the status page. If you have had any abnormal emergency procedures and have dealt with failures, the status page right here, and in worst cases, the summary of complex failures, will guide the crew as to the abnormal parts of the briefing that should be included. There's one last element I wanted to include in this particular presentation, and it's how we do briefings to the crew in case of an emergency. The emergency briefing that I want to discuss here is the NITS briefing given by the captain to the purser or senior cabin advisor in the cabin following an abnormal or emergency procedure. It is a simple layout designed to be straightforward in high stress situations. It summarizes the situation and the intended actions from the crew. It should be incorporated into the aeronautical decision making process by the flight crew, which can, depending on your operation, either be FORDEC, DOTA, DECIDE model, whichever one is used by your operation, this should be part of that decision-making process. And when I say it should be part of it, we do give the NITS briefing as part of the last part, when we have already identified what intentions we want to do, and we are then executing the intentions. However, always include the crew in the back in the situation as a whole. There may be information about the situation going on in the back that you're not familiar with, that you might need in order for you as the captain to form the best possible decision with the safest outcome. When we have made a decision and we would like to inform the crew, we will call the person to the cockpit over the PA with the standard phrase, purser to cockpit, please. Once the purser enters the cockpit, you will announce clearly that you would like to give them a NITS briefing. NITS stands for Nature, Intentions, Time, and Special Information. The person coming in to take the briefing will write the four items down. Remember, keep it simple. 
first, you will state the nature. You will say, this is a NITS briefing. The situation is we have X, X, and S. This is what has happened. Briefly, in a single or two sentences, what has happened. Remember, don't make anything technical here. That is not for the crew to know. Intentions. Here you state the intentions of the captain. This will tell the rest of the crew what to do, what checklist and procedures they should perform and how they should prepare for the situation. We will then state the time available for them to prepare for the emergency landing and this is the time to landing. Finally, any special information that might be applicable to the situation, here you should always think about elements, piece of information that the crew might need in order for them to perform their duties better and to save lives. So, an example of a NITS briefing from a captain in case of, for example, an engine to fire could be as following. This is a NITS briefing. We have lost engine number two due to a fire. We're unable to put out the fire on engine number two. Our intentions are to return back to our departure airport immediately. The time to landing is seven minutes. Please prepare the cabin for an emergency landing. On the right side, we still have a fire on the engine. Please be prepared for an emergency evacuation on the runway, but wait for my command as we're going to wait for fire services to put out the fire if we cannot do so in the air. Also be mindful, we might only be able to use the left side evacuation doors. Please repeat back the NITS briefing to me as you understand it. Thank you very much. Please go and inform your crew. The NITS briefing is there to give the crew the information they need to perform their duties to the best of their abilities. Always remember standard phraseology and communication in a multi-crew environment is crucial. And with this lesson, I hope that you and your fellow crew members will stay safer in the air. This is the Airbus New Briefing Techniques. This was a short video on a specific topic. If you want to see the hundreds of videos we made available on professional aviation content, head on to our academy at academy.mindspacex.com. And don't forget to hit the like button and the subscribe button to follow us. We'll be putting up these videos regularly.